Many miracles have happened in the last 20 years. Many miracles. The greatest of them is that 20 years ago, heterosexuals wrote our history. We write it now. <laughs> 20 years ago, we needed the Kinsey Institute to tell us that we existed. We raise our hands now and say, here we are. Count us. And so today, 20 years after Stonewall, I come to ask you to reaffirm what has been happening for the past 20 years. I ask you to declare for the heterosexual press no more lies. Woo! Woo! When you buy a newspaper tonight and they have not told the truth about today as they won't, don't just be mad. Call them up. Write a letter. No more lies. Woo! When they cover the parade tomorrow and they show a hundred thousand of us but they give equal time to twenty assholes protesting against us, call up the TV stations and say, no more lies. But the most important thing you can do is every day in your own life, in your own home, in your relationships with your family, your friends, and your jobs, tell yourself, no more lies. Enough. I stayed up all night with these boys and all my life enjoyed their handsome joys. I came with many companions to this dawn. Now I'm tired and must put down my pen. Reader, hear, this time understand how kind it is for men to love a man. Old love and present, future love the same. Hear and read what love is without shame. I want people to understand. They can, they can. They can! So open your ears and hear the voice of the classical band.
In the summer of 1969, when drag queens and street people were fighting the cops at Stonewall Inn, I had just finished my junior year in high school in St. Joseph, Missouri. Gay was merely a synonym for happy. I knew, of course, what homosexuals were. They were the most disgusting, sickening, perverted, vile things that had ever walked the face of the earth. They totally forsaken God's ways. Their only hope was in the blood of Jesus. And if they would repent and sin no more, he would forgive them. Then, and only then, they would be happy. You see, I wasn't queer. This was a normal adolescent phase. These tendencies would pass. I was not queer. The first time I heard of gay liberation was when I read in Time or Newsweek about some militant homosexuals who had stormed the American Psychiatric Association's meeting demanding they not be labeled sick. I was a student at Texas Christian University. They were sick. They needed help. I went to a psychiatrist. He gave me a battery of tests that told me that I was not homosexual, just had a problem relating to women. It could be fixed, he told me, and he gave me behavior modification exercises to teach me that vaginas were warm and beautiful and that my penis, my penis was the only one I would ever need. It worked! I got engaged. This was the final cure. I wasn't a faggot. I was a real man. As soon as I got married and had a few kids, this would all be over. She broke it off because of nightmares, and I knew God was giving her a sign. So I joined a monastery. There, I met Bill from Chicago. He told me a guy could be with other men and still be a decent, happy person. He told me there were organizations, clubs, and bars where gay men met and became friends, even lovers. This was radical information to me. Impossible, I concluded, back to the confessional. Never, never again would we stray from the path to glory. A political, a gay rag uh, in that area printed an article about the Dallas Gay Political Caucus. So I went for a meeting. It was headed by a hairdresser and a truck driver. <laughs> the truck driver was the butchest person I had ever seen. She even made my dad look like a wimp. <laughs> the hairdresser was my worst self-image fears personified. No, this wasn't for me. Maybe I really wasn't gay. Then a coup d'etat, normal gays, took over the DGPC. I went to a meeting. I joined. I got involved. We dressed in wingtip shoes, carried briefcases, wore three-piece suits, and told the biggest the politically correct phrase that we were just like them, except for with whom we went to bed. In 1979, I decided I was ahead of the times in Texas, but behind them in San Francisco, where there wasn't a gay organization, there were hundreds. I moved. It literally scared the hell out of me when I immersed myself into the frivolity of the adolescence that I had never been allowed to have. But I got over my fears, and I found myself with friends who accepted me for who I was as I was. I even found I was a likable guy. It's 1989. It's 1989. For three years, I've had AIDS. I live on welfare in Brooklyn. Often I'm asked, if you had the chance, would you do anything over differently? My answer? You bet. Two things. I'd have worn condoms earlier. And secondly, I would have always known that there is absolutely no reason why gay 
and happy can't be synonyms. Happy, happy gay and lesbian pride, my people.